Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. show and I'm here with Mark Johnston. How's it going Mark? I'm doing really great. How about yourself? Good. We were just talking about summer, all the travel and visiting family and all the plans. So I had a really full weekend and uh, I'm quite exhausted <laughs> from all the, the fun but that's how summer goes. So we hope that wherever you guys are that you're doing good and yeah. yeah. I, I can only imagine. I, I mean I think it's a little bit exhausting planning trips and we only have five kids. I can only imagine like what that's like to coordinate that for you <laughs> and your family. It always looks like we're like moving our entire house when we're just gone for the weekend. Like we had a trailer packed of stuff. It was just insane. <laughs> well, my kids keep uh, trying to convince us to get like the full size van, and we've been reluctant to to make that upgrade. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I can yeah. I can only imagine <laughs> for you guys. No, it looks like we're preparing for doomsday or something. <laughs> All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about habits that end or destroy a marriage. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to share um, a client win. Um, so I'll go ahead and share that one. Every week we like to focus on where we're making progress and what's going right. And so as we share these wins, I encourage you to as well look at something that went well this week, maybe something that you did better on, um, maybe something that you've been struggling with for a while that you finally had a breakthrough on. Because it's really important that we focus on what's going right, we tend to focus on everything that's not. <laughs> and today, this topic, I, know, I don't know, I feel like it's really important that we lay a really good foundation of focusing on the things that are going right and focusing on what is in our control rather than pointing fingers and blaming. Because we're looking at what habits that are unhealthy for a marriage, it's easy to be like, well, it's all their fault and all these things. But let's focus on what we can control, take ownership of our part and what is going right because that's where our power lies. So this client says, love you, Heather. You, Mark, and Anna, one of our coaches here, helped me immensely. Uh, hold on just a second. My screen cut off. Oh, help me immeasurably. Relationship reboot and the path method changed my thinking and moved my focus away from my pain and perspective to his pain perspective. Uh, help me focus on being better, not bitter, and to stretch and grow into the best version of me. You stirred hope. Thank you. Consider me a forever friend and top fan of what you and Mark and your team are doing. Showing people that there is hope in what feels like a hopeless situation. God bless. So that's an awesome win, and I'm really grateful for this amazing woman. I'm noticing my camera is, like, freaking out, I think. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I mean, everything looks fine on my end. Okay, for me, it's, like, flashing. So flashing my profile picture and, and the video, so whatever. Uh, for those who are listening to the recording, we always stream these live onto Facebook, and so sometimes we uh, have some issues that come up, but we just keep going. <laughs> All right. So that is a fabulous win. I love that she talks about shifting the perspective from pain um, and focusing on being better, not bitter, and that uh, her husband is also kind of shifting that narrative as well. Mark, what do you see as far as like that narrative there? If things are painful, I feel really bitter, and going through the journey of um, letting that go so that we can be better. Well, what I, what I notice here that she comments on and what I think we we, te we like to focus on in our, our program is she, she turned things away from kind of like her own perspective and being bitter there and gained some extra perspective on what her husband was going through. Uh, and I think that quite often leads to some really big wins. Um, now, do I... Do I think this is exactly what is needed for everyone? No, well, I think it helps in many cases, um, but you know, it's, it may not be the exact thing that everyone needs, but I think right here, it, from what she was describing, it's exactly what she needed. Uh, and like I said, I, I do think that quite often that very first step is gaining that, that extra perspective for yourself and for your partner. 
Awesome. Well, I just had a toddler come in the room. Like I said, we do these live, so I'm going to turn off my microphone. And uh, Mark, you can go ahead and go into our yeah. content. I'll we'll be back in a second. Yeah, no problem. So, yes, the topic here we we have we are saying okay, what habit habits end or destroy in marriage? Uh, now I want to I, I we worded it like that on purpose because here's the thing I don't think that a single event typically causes the end of a relationship and you might be saying okay well Mark what about and you might say things like an affair or what about this or that or whatever it happens to be my opinion here is that singular damaging events are usually the culmination of poor habits so we might have an affair yes and that might be the straw that breaks the the camel's back but the affair is a result of many other choices that led up to the, this event. And that's why I wanted to talk about the, these habits, because if we can catch these things early on, it's much easier to avoid the, that culminating event, that big disaster that, that usually spells the, the doom for the relationship. Now, when I was writing this, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, an easy way to start the discussion, I, I could just... I could have just gone into John Gottman's theory, his discussion of the four horsemen of divorce. We could say, okay, Gottman, very well-respected researcher in terms of relationships and marriage. I could just use his stuff and we could call it good. But, you know, I think we've talked about that before on the podcast. And, you know, personally, you know, I love Gottman's work. I think, you know, we, we use a lot of his ideas, um, but I don't think this describes everything. Um, but I did want to touch on it briefly in case you are not familiar with it, um, because it is a really great idea. We agree 100%. I just don't think it describes everything. I was bringing up the topic of Gottman's Four Horsemen of Divorce. Um, I, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because we've, we've discussed this in previous podcasts. It's pretty well known. You, you can look it up and lots of people comment on this. But just in case you're unaware, uh, John Gottman, very famous researcher, got really good at predicting um, which couples would eventually divorce within the next several years or so. And he said that there's four things that predicted this. It was defensiveness, stonewalling, criticism, and contempt. Now, what I'd like to comment on all of those um, and this gets into our habits that destroy marriage, a lot of these things um, are about feedback, about how it's shutting down feedback or giving damaging feedback. If we look at this, if we talk about like this, uh, like Gottman's Four Horsemen, um, like Gottman's criticism and contempt are about providing poor or damaging feedback. It's I'm, I'm giving biting remarks or I'm thinking negatively about my partner's character and I'm discussing this. Or stonewalling and, and defensiveness are about not receiving feedback well. Either I'm retreating and not hearing the feedback or I'm just shutting down or I'm getting angry and upset and fighting back against the feedback. Um, so I do think that this is like a, a really good way of describing very poor feedback, either giving or receiving. But I also think that there are other, um, other ways that couples also shut down feedback. And so like I'm saying, I think that his ideas are good, but like in, if we're gonna talk about all the different habits that destroy marriages, I don't think it's 100% complete. So like as an example here, Heather, uh, you know, like getting angry when your spouse complains, a lot of people might not like really realize this, but this would be defensiveness. Like having a sense that any feedback means I'm not working hard enough. And you know, I'm not afraid to admit like that Jen and I sometimes have to discuss this aspect. I I'll and, do and I'll, too. <laughs> um I would love to say that I do much better with with feedback, but you know, even I'm not immune to this. But you know Jen and I have discussed many times like that and Jen admits that it's really difficult for her to, to hear feedback from me sometimes because she thinks to herself, okay, I'm working really hard. If Mark is upset or complaining about something, it means I'm not doing enough. 
and she she shares this with with me. So she and I have to have very purposeful discussions around this sort of idea. I, you mentioned Heather that <laughs> you and Ben have the similar struggles. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, we've been doing this for, for many, many years, and we've been able to help so many couples, but uh, it really is like putting your money where your mouth is when it's your own relationship. And I'm just going to be really honest. Ben and I, we're in, like, we, we consider a really rough patch. Um, just got some feedback from him, right, that something I had said uh, over three years ago, I said it one time. Um, is a reason why he doesn't feel a lot of connection with me and how, why he's been withholding some both intim, uh, physical and emotional intimacy. And I knew that he was like, not we weren't as connected as before, but I had no idea that it was a comment I made three years ago. And then I don't even hardly remember making it, but to him, that was a really big thing. And so when he shared that with me, immediately went to defensiveness, right? Of like, what? <laughs> like. I know I've probably said, I'm sorry for that. Did that really warrant years and years of, of you being so withdrawn, you know? And then we're going through that right now. And so I share that um, because without the skills that I have now, without the principles that we know helps build connection, um, this would probably have been devastating years, several years ago, you know? And so like, <laughs> It's really hard to hear that from your spouse. It's really hard to know these things. It's really hard to get feedback. And they say, you know, this thing that you said or did years ago is why I've been like this all this time. Or, you know, they're blaming you for things or saying that what you did really hurt them. It's easy to get defensive. But the fact that that's like the instinctual reaction. Um, but we know that when we're in that, that state of defensiveness, it's really all about protecting ourselves. And our spouse is protecting themselves and that's not really building that kind of unity that we want in our marriage and so in a way like i know like i'm probably you know some of you are like well my situation's a million times worse than that right but i'm going through this right now like where i'm using these same exact principles and i i see these same patterns going on in my marriage and knowing that these are good warning signs so that I can take responsibility for my part and not just be a victim, not just blame him. Like we're looking at all these, like blame, you know, criticize, contempt, stonewalling. I could easily put up a defense and it's kind of been tempting to just say, I'm just going to shut you out now because I don't want you to shut me out. <laughs> but I know where that cycle leads. And so uh, having that awareness is really important. I think many couples, it's my perception that many couples have some area that they're sensitive in somewhere. <laughs> Everyone has like their weakness. Uh, like I said, like Jen uh, really has difficulty with receiving feedback and then feeling good enough. I know, you know, I think I've mentioned like my struggle in our relationship is, uh, you know, feeling like being able to receive that care or like being able to like accept that it's 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 a weird complicated thing. I mean, we could get really into this, but I'm just what I'm pointing out is that I think most couples have some sort of area that they're a little bit sensitive in, and you know, right there, what you're talking about uh, that could turn into something devastating for you and Ben, or for myself, uh, me and me and Jennifer. Uh, and what's gotten us through these sort of things is becoming a little bit more aware of where we are sensitive and not following the script so much. I, I mean, we can, we can, like I said, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on on Gottman's theory, but like what what I'm getting at here is, a lot of the these issues with the four horsemen are about not handling that feedback well, and it's just how you don't handle it well, whether that's getting defensive and angry and upset when you're hearing the feedback, or shutting down and stonewalling and avoiding things, or or maybe that you yourself are really pursuing and getting emotional and getting upset and you have to tell your partner just how upset you are and it ends up being these biting, critical, contemptuous remarks. Mm -hmm. I, if you as a couple, I will say this, if you as a couple do not handle feedback well on the regular, well, that, that is going to be a habit that will destroy the relationship. And I do think, you know, Gottman, is absolutely accurate on that. Uh, yeah. 
With that being said, though, like, and we're going to go into some more of these things, it could seem really doom and gloom. And that's not what we're about, though. It's important to have awareness about what these underlying issues are and the deeper root issues that are causing these cycles or these patterns, these, you know, um, habits that we get into with each other. Uh, but that's why we have the whole path process is how to change these. So I know I can understand like you're like, oh, yeah, I've got that one and we got that one and he does this and she does that. And right. And, and it's very easy to be like, oh, my goodness, like we are, we're struggling with all of those things. There must be no hope for us. And that's not true. It's just important to have awareness about where you are so that you can start to choose some new cycles and some new patterns. I really liked the other side of the coin of this. Now, I don't think that when I was reading Gottman's books that he connected these two principles. But I do recall him saying like one of the most important skills that a couple can have in order to be to be healthy is the ability to repair after conflict. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that these are opposite sides of the same coin. Like, you know, can you handle feedback well? And the thing is, his point why he made this comment, he said that basically no relationship is going to be perfect. You're going to need feedback at some point and you're going to have some conflict at some point can you recover from that and he said that that right there is the most important skill i yeah. uh, and i i do think that the healthiest relationships are ones that have an ability to tell their partner when something isn't going well and that support is needed and for the that partner to hear that and provide the support um I'm just reading the comment that popped up here by Christine. Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll, we'll probably come back to that in, in just a moment. Any, any more comments, Heather, on uh, feedback? Yeah, let's go a little deeper in like the shutting down feedback, giving damaging feedback, and showing what that looks like in examples that we've seen with our clients and even in our own marriages. Sure. Uh, as an example, I'll, I'll, I'll share, you know, from personal experience, like this has been the dynamic that Jen and I have struggled with and where it could have gone wrong is, you know, I, I'm really averse to like, I, I, for some reason I'm very sensitive about other people getting upset around me. Like I, I don't like it and I, I tend to avoid it. So what the dynamic that happens between Jen and I is uh, where, you know, I, I try to give some feedback. I see that Jen is upset when she receives this feedback. And so previously my tendency was to back off. I'm like, oh, you know, it's actually not that important. And I'm just gonna back off from this. And, you know, so what ends up happening is I don't feel heard. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and this is, very frequently uh, what happens in these pursuer avoider sort of dynamics if you have someone who is avoiding things they're going to either avoid bringing up their own concerns and that builds up a fair amount of resentment uh, and that can result in that resentment eventually exploding or bubbling out and coming out sideways um, so I, I see that kind of dynamic quite frequently uh, I've lost my train of thought, I'll be honest. <laughs> so that was one example. Uh, I do know like other examples of this uh, in terms of like if we, if we were to go into stonewalling uh, as an example, where we, once again, a pursuer avoider sort of dynamic where we have someone who wants to bring up the, the challenges, they want to discuss problems and we have a partner who's like, I don't want to deal with this problem. I don't want to hear it. This is stressful. It's too emotional. Um, quite often I, I hear in these same sort of situations, I hear the person who is stonewalling say things like, I'm feeling judged or I'm feeling like this is too much. This is overwhelming. And so they just don't have the conversations at all. Mm -hmm. uh, like. There's lots of different ways that these can manifest. If I had to really summarize what this looks like, it's usually when feedback becomes personal or it becomes overly emotional. And it can look like differently depending on what those emotions are. If you're, you, you could be really, uh, as an example, uh, 
critical if you get really sad or angry and you're just really riding those emotions and you need, you're the one that wants to bring it up. At the same time, if you're the one that's avoiding things, you can get sad and angry and just shut down. And then that turns into stonewalling instead of criticism or contempt. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in almost all these cases, it's, it comes down to those two things. It's when feedback becomes overly um, emotional um, or when feedback becomes overly personal. So how then would we be able to have a conversation where we need to give feedback to our spouse or they need to give feedback to us that wouldn't be overly emotional um, and be done in the right way, right? How could we have that conversation and be able to give that feedback and receive that feedback in a healthy way? So I think there are different ways depending on who you are. Uh, like I, I've mentioned in previous uh, podcasts, so ha Jen and I are seeing a, a life coach. And I, I noticed that this coach really, really likes people being in tune with feelings. And like his solution to a lot of things is like, okay, let's actually have you experience some of those feelings that you are putting down. And I think that there's a lot of merit in that uh, for many people. Uh, that's so we we he might you know he might um, say that okay we can make this less emotional by having an outlet for your emotions. Uh, for me personally, I, I get that. I, I don't know if I 100% agree. I think that's good for a lot of people. For me, I like to personally like analyze things, and I, I like to be a little bit more cerebral. So like for me, um, I need to remind myself, okay, like this is a situation that it's necessary for feedback to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to say that I'm, I have to remind myself, this is not something that's personal. I think, um, and I, I just kind of, for me personally, I have to consciously say, okay, I'm going to shut down this, uh, these emotions and I'm going to look at this much more logically. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I do think that like, that's, I'm, I'm a, different sort of person in that regard and like this is something that I have to I've had to get used to many many times as I deal with very emotional people <laughs> in sessions what, what I'm getting at here is I think there are different approaches to this um, there are different ways to get to the same outcome um, but I do think that that same outcome is what's is needed is to be able to step away from emotions either through having a healthy outlet or being able to you know just mentally step away from some of these emotions. Yeah. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of that you could do for that. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Yeah, and so I think that's part of the work that we all have to do, right? Is we can say, okay, what I, the way I've been doing this hasn't really been working. I have been over emotional. I have made it really personal <laughs> and it's kind of backfired. And so what do I need to do to approach these feedback moments um, from the healthiest place possible for me and the relationship and my spouse? and then discover what that looks like for you. For me, that looks more like processing through emotions. I'm not sure if it's like an outlet to the emotion, but it's processing through it. It's allowing myself to feel it fully in a way so that then I can kind of let it go and let it um, not feel so <laughs> uh, dominating <laughs> in my, inside me. And so then when I kind of give myself that uh, processing time, then I'm able to be a lot more clear minded and connected to my my true desire in my heart. Um, it's the mind and heart connection that really helps me to unify with Ben. I, I like what you said, and it reminded me um, a little bit of like a little bit of what what I do myself. Uh, for me, like like a, I I I agree. I, I need to process the emotions that are there. I uh, for some reason, like if I'm able to process it and say, okay, right now I'm feeling angry and I'm feeling upset because of this. It allows me to, to express, like if I, if I make observations about what's going on, it helps me get that out there. And it like, it allows me to almost look at how I'm feeling from the outside. And for me, that that's tremendously helpful. And this is actually why in our program, you know, like uh, quite frequently when I'm um, talking to clients about Okay, how do we settle things down? I talk about, okay, let's observe some of these emotions. Um, and just being able to observe it and people feeling like they're noticed frequently 
brings this emotion down. Yeah, it is a lot about validation. I, I feel this way and, and, and I do, I feel this way. <laughs> and even acknowledging to yourself that that's how we feel um, does bring it down because we feel heard or seen or validated in some way. And that in, in and of itself helps reduce the intensity of those feelings. Christine asked here, how do you communicate though both are different types? I assume she means pursuer and avoider. I'm just going to give you the 30 second answer, Christine, because I do think this would be helpful for everyone else to hear. Um, I mean, this is this is an oversimplification. I will say that, but I tend, that I tend to recommend that, you know, especially if both partners are involved, I say, okay, hey, pursuer, you need to back off a little bit. An avoider, you need to step forward a little bit. Um, almost always what this means is the the uh, avoider I, I recommend that they define when the discussion will happen and almost always it becomes <laughs> sounds terrible but the responsibility of the pursuer to define if the uh, argument is going to happen or the discussion is going to happen mm -hmm. so uh, um, the avoider is going to tend to just not bring things up so we need to have the pursuer define that if and then the uh, avoider defines, okay, like this is when I'm going to be comfortable having this discussion. So they define the when. Like uh, and that usually brings things some decent amount of balance. You need to play with it a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how Ben and I do it because I'm the pursuer and he's the avoider. So I say, okay, we need, we need to talk about something and when would be a good time in the next, I usually give him 24, maybe 48 hours. <laughs> Otherwise I just know it, you know, he'll just, push it back as far as he can. Um, and so then then I feel like he feels respected and I feel like, okay, I can put this down. We are going to address it at some point. Cool. Um, so <laughs> we spent quite a bit of time just on one habit. Yeah. Feedback. <laughs> we actually have, we might end up uh, making this a two-parter, but I think we, we can yeah. get to some of these other topics here. Um, I think the next habit that really tends to break down a relationship is if there is restraining space for individual wants or needs. Like if you, if there's a lot of resistance to things that are positive in, in someone's life. Mm -hmm. um, so what this might look like, uh, it might be, here's someone who provides feedback, say, hey, I really am interested in X, Y, or Z and the other partner doesn't really see these wants or desires as a necessity. And, and these, I'm gonna give some real examples of things that I've seen with clients. So I, I, I've seen this breakdown of many relationships, as in, uh, I remember one client whose partner wanted to go to school, and my, uh, my client was like, okay, you don't need to go to school, you don't need to go through all that trouble, I make enough to provide for both of us, so why bother? It's gonna, it's just going to cost money and all this stuff. The point was like my, my client in this example um, wasn't really looking at the desire. Uh, they weren't really considering what was, what, what was needed. They were just, they, they were focused on other things. And it's not that my client was malicious or trying to control things. It's just that he wasn't really in tune with what his wife needed or another example. Um, I saw this with a, with a friend recently um, where the, the husband is saying, okay, I don't want to travel. I'd much rather just stay at home in response to the wife's desire to go out and have adventures and go out on vacations. He's like, eh, it's, I'm just, I'm comfortable here. Why don't we just relax? We'll just, uh, we'll have a staycation here. And like the wife that I was talking to, she's like, ah, like, what? like this was maddening to her that her husband didn't want to go out. Um, as a even more real example, very recently, um, between Jen and I, Jen has been, uh, sometimes I describe my wife uh, as a, a gypsy, uh, as in like every, every once in a while she's like, okay, if anyone's seen the movie Chuck a lot, um, the, there's a gypsy character and she's like, okay, the west wind is blowing, which means it's just time to move. It's time to move on. <laughs> And this is how um, my wife is sometimes, and that west, west wind is moving, and we've been in the same location now for like 10 years, and she's like, I got to move. Uh, I, I could easily say, okay, the kids are in a really good school. They've established friends. 
and we don't need to move because you know I could work from anywhere because I, I work remotely. Uh, how I've been approaching this though is I've been saying, okay, this is really important to you. Why don't we look at some houses? Why don't we go visit your parents who live in North Carolina, another state, and why don't we look at houses while we're there? And let's explore some options and let's see what you know our house could go for at this point. And so. Uh, I'm making it a point, even though that I don't feel any strong desire or need to move, I'm making it a point to really make sure that Jen feels supported in this desire. And I think this is what tends, you know, if, if this isn't handled well, what tends to break down some relationships. Uh, I do think that a lot of times when this goes wrong, the habit stems from a lack of consideration or empathy. Not that it's purposeful. I don't think, you know, most of the time when I encounter this out in the wild or out, you know, with clients, mm -hmm. it's not like uh, the, the person who isn't considering these wants or needs, it almost seems like they, they're more clueless rather than like they're purposely trying to shut their partner down. It's more of like this lack of awareness of what mm -hmm. is actually needed. And it's largely because, you know, each partner essentially is looking at their own perspective of things. So the one part, per, partner shutting it down is like, well, I, I don't need this. Why should you need it? And you get that message enough and it can feel stifling or controlling. Right. And then the next one, if we're good to keep going. Yeah, sure. All right. Which is a little bit more of that um, intentional is mm -hmm. punishment withholding, controlling tactics. And again, this one kind of strikes true for me <laughs> in my marriage right now. Uh, but what that looks like is like, um, you know, you did this to me, um, so now you have to go sleep on the couch, or I'm gonna go sleep on the couch, or I'm gonna withhold intimacy. I talked about that as a punishment. It's a manipulation, it's a way to control. And again, I'm experiencing this right now in real time. So it's a, you said this one thing to me three years ago, so I'm gonna withhold intimacy from you. I'm going to uh, not connect with you in this way to punish you. <laughs> uh, and then like requirements before one partner or another can get what they need, right? So you have to do this before I'll give you this. We hear this a lot and it is the destructive side of the intimacy cycle of where you didn't do this for me, so now I'm not going to do this for you. And then they feel like, okay, well, you didn't do that for me, so now I'm not going to do this for you. And I won't do X, Y, Z. Like, I won't open up emotionally. I won't have sex with you. I won't let you spend time with the kids, whatever it looks like, right, until you X, Y, Z. And so there's a lot of this um, passive aggressiveness, I think, is probably a good word that's going on it's not um it's usually not said with words so much it's more said with actions mm -hmm. so there's a story here of john and, and sarah you want to share that one mark yeah so i, I changed the names because you know this was a real <laughs> example um some people that i know uh i will say that this couple ended up getting divorced uh, and i remember the wife coming and saying okay you know, what was me? She was talking about all these things that were wrong in her relationship. But she uh, shared this like one example where her husband wouldn't let her go out with friends unless she had sex with him that evening. He's like, well, why, why should I do you a favor here? Uh, you know, as in watch the kids, which I'm gonna, uh, we're not gonna even get into why. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad sort of way to, to frame things. but. He's like, I'm not going to watch the kids. I'm just going to leave um, and, you know, effectively trap her there at the, ho the house with the kids if she wasn't going to have sex with them. Um, and while, you know, I, I liked each of these friends individually, the husband and wife, like that was such a bonehead sort of move uh, because it is exactly what you were describing, Heather. It was this like um, punishment or withholding mm -hmm this controlling sort of thing when in reality like neither one of them were saying what they really meant they were discussing it with actions like exactly how you described it 
Yeah, and that really stems from like keeping score, you know, I'm doing more than you, right? We tend to do that game. <laughs> Who's giving more to the relationship? Well, I'm not gonna give until you give more, you know, or I do this and, and you didn't do as much as me. I mean, we do that a lot, right? Building up that resentment of you hurt me or you didn't meet my need. And so I'm gonna hold on to that resentment. And again, discussing feedback. Like Mark said, you really aren't communicating clearly what you want, what you need with each other and finding a way to meet those needs together as a team. And then an ability to effectively discuss feelings directly. So you go about it in this kind of, um, like I said, passive aggressive way where you use manipulation to try to get what you want or to try to teach your spouse something or to try to show them how angry or hurt you are. <laughs> Instead I mean, I could see through like what was going on with John and Sarah there, like John wasn't feeling loved, wasn't feeling connection, um, but wasn't really discussing that effectively. He thought, okay, well, I'll get it by coercing my, my wife to get what I want. And when you have like all those, like almost like this emotional constipation here, uh, <laughs> like when it's all gummed up like that, you get situations like this where there is coercion and controlling tactics. And very damaging. I mean, Ben and I both regret that we hadn't talked about it three years ago. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a lot, that's a heavy price to pay for something that was said in a moment of, you know, anger. And but that's what happens when we don't have the tools and resources to heal things is that they can become more and more severe. All right, and then the next um, habit that we see is letting intimacy or connection fade. And what that looks like is a lack of interest in each other, right? You're too busy, you don't have time for each other, or you're just seeking attention or seeking needs met from other people, um, you know, especially of the opposite sex, gender they feel attracted to, and no common interests anymore. So you tend to just kind of fall apart. And over time, you're not really working actively on building that connection there, not creating time and space for each other especially as you're raising kids or you have your busy lives. It's not, we're not saying you have to do everything together because that would be unhealthy as well. Um, but what really leads to this happening where we have this dissolving of intimacy and connection, Mark? Yeah, so effectively what happens in many couples, you know, is that they, they start off and they have much more time or energy for each other. And what, frequently happens is as they get used to each other, they stop prioritizing the relationship and they focus more on more immediate or urgent situations going on. Like maybe it's work, maybe it's children. Um, and they end up failing to set boundaries or walls up to protect the relationship. So they say, okay, well, we haven't gone out on a date in a few weeks, but you know, little Billy, our son, is really sad and wants someone to spend some time with him, so I'm gonna go spend time with little Billy. Or, you know what, um, it's been really stressful at work, I just need some me time. And they don't, they they end up saying, okay, well, my marriage is gonna be there. They're, they're just gonna, they're gonna keep being there no matter what, and generally it's from this place of like, I feel safe and secure with the relationship. So we don't need to prioritize it. And this is, what what's happening? I, I really like um, the uh, the book that mentioned you know where I first read this. It was a long long time ago. Uh, the book was Fighting for Your Marriage, and I, I'm I th I want to say that the authors are Markman, Stanley, and Bloomberg, and I think I got the names right. Mm -hmm. I think so. But anyways, uh, it was specifically talking about this concept of like okay. The marriage as a relation, uh, as a institution, it needs protecting from these outside sources. Uh, I, I remember even one of the suggestions it gave, it says, okay, you, you go out on dates, you make that a regular thing, but then you put boundaries or walls around that date and you don't discuss all the, the other things. You, you just, there's a focus in on each other. And I do think that if you don't, if you, you, you let those boundaries fade, it's going to lead to this kind of meh, dull, uninteresting, unconnecting sort of relationship. Yeah, we're just kind of going through the motions. And yeah, so we need the antidote to that, of course, would be having those healthy boundaries. 
and making sure that you do take care of yourself, but that you're also taking care of the relationship because just like a plant, it has to be protected from the elements. It needs to be regularly nourished. It isn't something that we just plant the seed once and we're one and done for the rest of our lives. It's something we continually need to nourish and, and protect there. So I think one thing that we'd like to go into maybe a little bit deeper in next week's podcast, because I think that this can go really well with what we're talking about next week. Um, the last one here is lack of accountability, responsibility for your own thoughts, feelings, and behavior. I know that a lot of us, when we're listening to probably these pot, this podcast right here and the things that we talked about, you're saying, oh, I see my spouse does that. I see my spouse does that. I see my spouse does that. And this, 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 and this. And maybe a few of you are like, oh, yeah, I do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it really is about taking 100% responsibility for our part so that that's where our power lies. I do think that that would be a great topic to go into depth on its own because I, I think a just accountability and responsibility in general, like how to provide accountability for your partner, how to have accountability for yourself um, is, is a really big topic and a really important one in having healthy interactions because like you, like you were kind of describing here, I think it can very easily slip into this sort of blame sort of situation where they're responsible for all, all of our relationship woes and they need to change. And if you, if you don't have that accountability, if you don't know how to hold your partner accountable for what really is their responsibility, and if you don't hold yourself accountable, I think that can turn into a really unhealthy situation. I think that would be super valuable. If you guys would love that, let us know here in the Thriving Marriage. Leave a comment and say yes, that, that would be something that would be helpful for you. All right, well, we're almost out of time, but let's do a real quick marriage myth buster. Avoiding conflict will ruin your marriage. <laughs> so this is kind of funny, especially at the end of this podcast where we talked a lot about giving feedback and addressing some of these issues. Um, but this whole myth that if you avoid conflict completely, it will ruin your marriage. So, so yeah, we'll just start right off the bat with what I think is the truth here. Um, and if you guys have been watching or listening into these podcasts, you almost always I come to the conclusion that there's a little bit of truth to some of these concepts and there's a little bit that's not. Uh, in this case, I do think that balance is often needed with conflict between letting go of some of the small things and speaking up when you have difficulty letting things go. Uh, as an example, like if you were annoyed at some small habit that your spouse does like and you kept bringing it up and you kept saying that this is a big problem you know, like something that's very small i think that would be problematic and that would lead lead to a high amount of stress and in certain partners i think that would lead to shutting down and not want not being able to connect very well at the same time a lot of what we've been talking about today is there you do need to be able to resolve some concerns I do think that this sort of myth is centered right around exactly what we were talking about in terms of the pursuer avoider sort of dynamic where one partner prefers to meet conflict head on and pursue it until it's settled. And another partner might prefer to let go of many of the smaller conflicts. Um, otherwise, I don't think that even this, this concept would really come up all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, the avoider argues that these conflicts are just they're not worth it, or they're too much trouble. And the pursuer argues, okay, well, we need to deal with this now. And I'll admit, like I, I mentioned earlier, I tend to lean more towards the, the side of avoiding arguments, but at the same time, I recognize that the healthiest relationships eventually settle their major conflicts. I really like your, your system there, Heather, that you mentioned, you're like, you bring something up, you, and you give Ben the space to decide when the two of you are going to discuss it. Or like I mentioned, the pursuer is going to decide, define if there's a conflict and the avoider is going to decide, uh, define when. I, I think that's a really good system. Uh, avoiding conflict does run the risk of building up resentment until it builds up so much that it can explode. And we see this a lot with our clients. At the same time, if you pursue each and every problem doggedly until everyone is 100% satisfied, well, it, that may be an unattainable goal. Uh, and if you keep chasing conflict like that, it just becomes exhausting. And someone is just going to prefer to leave those things alone. And so, therefore, the key is open discussion 
with this dynamic if this is a problem for you as a couple and balance. Um, like I said, I think the really just basic system that works really well is that uh, each of you gets to define something if or when. Um, and I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is a way oversimplification, but I think that's a, a really good place to start and see how well that works. Um, so in terms of the myth of this thing, uh, it's both true and not true. <laughs> you don't want to avoid all conflict. You also don't want to pursue all conflict. Pursue all conflict, right. Beautiful. So if at uh, this point you are thinking, wow, I really could use some help with this. I want to be able to know how to effectively resolve some of these things with my spouse. I'm seeing where I've made some mistakes. I've been doing some of these habits. I've been doing, you know, my partners had some of these habits and we see that this isn't a good trajectory for our marriage. Then we encourage you to uh, book a free call with us at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply so that we can show you how to use the path method going from the place where your sp spouse wants out, maybe you want out, to being able to reconcile these differences, overcome these misunderstandings, build real lasting connection and trustworthiness between you so that you have a thriving marriage. So I encourage you guys to do that. And next week, we're going to discuss accountability, responsibility, and how to address this in your marriage. Thank you, Mark, and we hope that you have a wonderful, thriving day. See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.